For the last few weeks, we've been reading the same scripture in worship, the story of the woman with the alabaster jar, and exploring what these different gospel tellings of the scripture have to teach us about what it means to live as people who are extravagantly generous. And so a couple weeks ago, we read Mark's version of this story, and we honed in on that little detail that he sneaks in, that this woman breaks her jar before she anoints Jesus, teaching us that the first step to living as people of extravagant generosity is naming our brokenness, naming the things that are silently killing us so that then we can live generously. Then we read Matthew's version last week when he slips in a detail that the woman was so eager to anoint Jesus that she poured the oil on his head while he was still at the dinner table, which I think is a signal to us that true generosity (coughs) doesn't wait for the perfect time. It is always urgent because it is always in response to God's grace for us. Mark and Matthew do keep some of the details of the story the same, though. We've, the last two weeks, focused on what is different. If you think about these three weeks as a Venn diagram, we had Mark, we had Matthew, and today we're going to look at how they intersect, uh, because they both tell the story and report that Jesus responds in the same way. After the woman anoints Jesus, there are men at the dinner table, and they get very bent out of shape with what she has done, and they speak up about it. And Jesus responds to their disgruntled comments in the same way. And so today, we're going to explore what those strong words might have to say to us about extravagant generosity. So our scripture reading today is adapted from Matthew and Mark's version. So if you like to follow along in the Bible, this is going to make you crazy because you can't. (laughs) You'll need to be going back and forth, but uh, we have combined their telling so that you can hear um, some of the lines that they keep the same. And so Rebecca and I will share it, the scripture reading, and we will emphasize the lines that they both report. And let us begin with a word of prayer. Holy extravagant God, we are ready to serve your people, ready to get on with our day, ready to make things happen, ready to go. But you have called us here first. We are here to worship you and to learn from you. We are here to listen to your word, to make sense of your word that our service might be in line with your will for us. So calm our pacing minds and hearts. Make us still that we might truly hear and understand your word to us today, your word that has the power to transform us and make us ready, extravagant disciples. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Now, while Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, A woman came to him with a jar, with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment. Of nard. And she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But when the disciples saw it, they were angry and said, Why this waste? Why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for a large sum. For more than 300 denarii. And and the the money money given given to to the the poor. poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She She has has performed performed a good good service service for me. For you always have the poor with you. And you can always show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. By pouring this ointment on my body, She has prepared me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
When was the last time it happened to you? When someone saw you? When someone really saw you? You know when it happens because it is so different than most of our daily interactions. When someone really sees you, they don't see your profession or your house, however fancy or humble it may be. They don't see your net worth or your car or your clothes, or they don't see you as a person who could offer them services. When someone really sees you, none of the labels that we get trained to apply to ourselves matter much anymore. When someone really sees you, they see the stuff that actually matters. They see the grief that still lingers, even though it's been years since the death. They see the joy that is bubbling up just underneath the surface. They see the anxiety that's close at hand that wakes you up in the night. They see your capacity for hope. They see suffering. When someone really sees you, it has a way of piercing the soul and reminding us of what actually matters. Now, there was a man who had a knack for really seeing people. I have no idea whether he would have called it that or claimed this about himself, but it sounds to me like he had a knack for really seeing people. He was a prominent pastor, and he frequently got invited to preach and teach in other places. Now, these invitations are usually an honor for pastors, but they inevitably spark an awkward conversation about money, which usually goes something like this. Somebody invites a pastor to preach, and then they say, now, how much do you charge, or do you charge? What's one more sermon to a pastor? And then pastors get really awkward and fumble because unlike attorneys or photographers or designers, our profession doesn't come with a clear hourly rate. And it feels awkward to put a price on preaching the grace of God. So most of us pastors don't navigate those conversations very well at all. But this pastor, he offered the same response, no matter how big or small the invitation, he never fumbled. How much do you charge, they'd ask. And he gave the most unique answer. I trust your generosity, he'd respond. I trust your generosity. What is that if not a soul-piercing response about the stuff that really matters? We show up here week after week after week as people who believe that we are made in the image of God. And if we believe that, then we have to trust that we were each created to be generous because God is nothing if not generous. God created this world with such care. What is that if not extravagant generosity? God knit you together in your mother's womb and knows every hair on your head. How generous is that? God sent his only son to live among us and know our human suffering. How generous. God gave his only son so that we could know life and life abundant. What is that if not generous? God brings hope out of despair and life out of death. Generous. If we believe that we are made in the image of God, then generosity should be the first thing we trust about ourselves and about one another. I trust your generosity because I trust that you were created in the image of our extravagantly generous God. That's what that pastor was saying. Now, I'm sure there are people who were annoyed with his answer. It sure would be easier if he just named a price so that the people inviting him would know whether he was within their budget or not. But see, that would assume a one-size-fits-all, and he knew that he was preaching in places with various resources. So instead of naming a price, 
he named a truth, and he forced others to claim that God-given truth about themselves. That's why I think giving to the church is so important for people of faith. You know, churches could operate like other nonprofits. We could have levels of giving and publish a donor list at the end of the year, just like the reports you get from the Arboretum or your alma mater or the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. Churches could operate like country clubs and have joining fees and monthly membership dues. Churches could operate like private schools with annual tuition. Quite frankly, I imagine that any one of those things would help the church's bottom line. But they all miss the point. Because at the end of the day, funding the church's budget and ministry needs are simply the byproduct of faithful stewardship. Naming a price would spare each of us the necessity of looking in the mirror and seeing ourselves for who we really are. Children made in the image of a generous God. And that's what this season is all about. That is why we are harping on extravagant generosity because a pledge to the church is what happens after we look in the mirror and remember that God has created us to be generous. A pledge is just what happens when we embody our generosity. We may as well say, I trust my generosity when putting a pledge card in the plate because it is, after all, who God created us to be. Have you ever looked at a donor report and saw someone you know and thought to yourself, I would have expected them to be in a different category? Everyone does it. It's so tempting to compare or make assumptions about what generosity should look like for other people. In fact, I think we are better trained to talk about what generosity looks like for everyone but ourselves. That's what the men at the dinner table were doing. They were upset because they had a plan for this woman. They knew what generosity should look like for her. So if she wanted to get rid of such a lavish possession, then she should have the good sense to sell it and give the money to the poor, they said. But Matthew and Mark both report that Jesus will have none of it. He snaps back and tells them to lay off because she has done a good service. A good service. She has done a good service not because Jesus needed to be anointed, and certainly not because he asked to be anointed, but because in that single act of generosity, she was delighting in who God had created her to be. A good service. That's Jesus' version of, I trust your generosity. She wasn't concerned about what tier her generosity would fall into and how it would compare to those men around the table, because generosity is personal. Only you know enough about your life to know what extravagant generosity is for you today. Just like the woman, we can only do the good that is ours to do with the resources that are at our disposal. That woman didn't bother to ask others how they defined generosity. She didn't go around town trying to figure out who she had to one-up she went with what was hers, her jar, her oil, and she made an offering that reflected who God made her to be, a woman of extravagant generosity. That's the invitation for each of us. That is why faithful giving is different than being a donor to any other nonprofit. Because giving born of faith asks you, actually it requires you to look in the mirror and own who God has created you to be. Now I can't tell you what an extravagantly generous offering is for you. Only you can figure that out. Maybe it is making the same offering you did last year. Maybe it's reducing it because your life has changed and generosity looks very different. 
Maybe it's increasing your offering because while you offered something last year, you wouldn't consider it generous based on the resources entrusted to you. Maybe it's offering something for the first time. And if that's the case, watch out because you might just see how God, how embracing your God-given generosity can change your faith in incredible ways. And if you wonder how you'll know when you've made a generous offering, you'll know. You'll know because your offering will be at a level that reminds you that you are a giver and not a taker, that you are a master of your resources and not a slave to them. But most of all, you'll know it's generous because you've offered your heart along with your dollars. And the joy that comes from that cannot be replicated by anything else. Matthew and Mark both end their telling of this story in the same way. Those strong words from Jesus affirming her good service. We know that her offering is extravagant. Extravagant enough that all four gospel writers needed to tell about it. But what makes it good? I think it's good because she answered the question that only she could answer. What does generosity look like for me and my resources? I think it's good because she gave not out of obligation, but out of joy because she had been deeply seen. Jesus saw her. Jesus really saw her and reminded her that she too had been created in the image of a generous God. I trust that when we embrace who God has called us to be, and live as people of extravagant generosity, then our service will be called good too. You know, one of the many reasons that our church does not publish a list of tiered giving, as other not-for-profits do, it's because our elders trust your generosity and mine. And you know what? Jesus does too. He trusts us. Because we are made in the image of a generous God. Don't ever forget it. Amen.